Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Europe podcast available every morning on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen. It's Tuesday the 7th of May here in London. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, UBS smashes past profit estimates in the first quarter as it prepares to complete the Credit Suisse merger this month. Israel rejects a ceasefire proposal backed by Hamas and vows to continue its military operation in Gaza. And change is good, except when it isn't. Why moving jobs doesn't always make you happier. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. UBS's first quarter profits have smashed past estimates with the bank reporting net income of almost $1.8 billion. That's three times what analysts were expecting from the Swiss banking giant. The outperformance was driven by larger pre-tax profits from its investment bank and wealth management divisions. UBS says it's expecting to complete the legal merger with Credit Suisse on the 31st of May with $1.3 billion of expenses linked to the integration in the second quarter. Israel's war cabinet has unanimously rejected a Gaza ceasefire proposal backed by Hamas, saying that it does not meet the country's necessary demands. It's understood that any deal would include the release of Israeli hostages held in Gaza in exchange for Palestinians detained in Israeli jails and a pause in fighting. Jonathan Panikoff of the Atlantic Council's Middle East programme says that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing increasing pressure from inside his own country. Domestically, it's a real challenge. Hostage families and Israelis as a whole have been calling for a a temporary ceasefire for months now that would bring another set of hostages home. The November release of hostages seems like a lifetime ago. And really, there's an increasing pressure in Israel for Benjamin Netanyahu and the coalition to make progress on the hostages being released. Jonathan Panikoff's comments come as Israel said that it would send a delegation to meet with mediators to exhaust the possibility of reaching an agreement. Meanwhile, Israel's military on Monday told civilians to move out of parts of the southern Gaza city of Rafah in a possible prelude to a long-expected attack on the area. Xi Jinping has called on France to help prevent a new Cold War. China's leader told his French counterpart Emmanuel Macron that the two countries should be fostering closer economic ties rather than decoupling. Bloomberg's Chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel says this comes as the EU has been more robust in its trade relations with China. Clearly he has a mission to offer the Europeans China's economic uh, benefits. The European Union is sort of aligning itself more towards a U.S. position towards China on trade on a number of issues and potential tariffs on EVs and and the like. And also, of course, the security threat with the war in Ukraine uh, into its third year right now. And that is at front and centre. Angle adds that China's no-limits friendship with Russia has stirred distrust in European capitals. France's Macron responded to Xi, saying that there cannot be security in Europe without security in Ukraine. Richmond Federal Reserve President Thomas Barkin says the full impact of high interest rates is yet to come. The voting policymaker added that he still expects to hit the central bank's 2% target without further hikes. It comes as central bank speakers like New York Fed President John Williams continue to signal caution over murky economic data. We have the maximum employment and price stability goals. So we want to, from my perspective, see all the data and information uh, that speaks to all of that. And really, you know, as the data, uh, you know, come in, hopefully uh, we'll be moving in the direction we want to see both on inflation and in terms of restoring balance to the economy. And then we'll make our decisions based on, on that. John Williams speaking there. Both Williams and Barkin joined other rate setters in voting unanimously to keep US rates at a two-decade high last week. UK AI startup Wave has raised a billion dollars in funding for its self-driving technology. It's one of the largest cash injections for a European AI venture on record. NVIDIA, SoftBank and Microsoft are three of the key investors in Wave, which was, co- which was founded by CEO Alex Kendall in 2017. Although no valuation was disclosed, the company says this should be its last major funding round as it starts to profit from commercial deals. 
Job seekers looking for a happier work life with a new employer may find the grass isn't always greener. That's according to new US research that shows recent switchers are less satisfied than those who stayed put. Bloomberg's Tiwa Adebayo has the details. Once a surefire way to make workers happier, switching jobs is now leaving them more miserable than before. A survey from the U.S. Conference Board found that in 2022, recent hires had greater job satisfaction, but just a year later, that trend has reversed. Lucrative pandemic pay bumps could be to blame for the change, encouraging job hunters to ignore other factors like culture and training. Despite the dip in new hire sentiment, ratings for overall job satisfaction are still at their highest since 1987. In London, Tiwa Adebayo, Bloomberg Radio. Those are your top stories on the markets. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index is two tenths of 1% higher. Eurostox 50 futures are up by three tenths of 1%. And the 10-year Treasury yield down two basis points at 4.47%. Now, in a moment, we'll get the latest on the developments in the Middle East and we'll also dig into those earnings from UBS. But first, another story that caught our eye. Um, Actually, there were loads of interesting stories on the Bloomberg Terminal this morning. What do you eat for breakfast? Uh, I mean, which breakfast, Caroline, is the question. I have several (laughs) every day. Um, But uh, this is about coffee, uh, which I know that you're looking at me very pointedly as you are not a coffee drinker and I am. But Javier Blas is worried. Absolutely. Our colleague Javier Blas actually has... Um, a fantastic continental breakfast. So he eats bread, a dash of olive oil and a coffee. And he is, of course, um, one of our lead uh, commodity writers. And he's been uh, saying that actually he's having to be more cautious with the dash of olive oil because prices have been at a record high. And now he's very worried about coffee prices too. The more serious point being that, yes, weather has affected coffee prices, but so too uh, a new booming market in China. Yeah, well, this is actually because of the competition that coffee has, uh, the Robusta coffee bean in particular, with durian fruit. Mm. And in fact, because of the demand for durian fruit from China, means that a lot of growers are choosing to grow that instead of coffee, which adds to supply difficulties and things like bad weather and other things that disrupt the growth for the beans too. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really uh, very interesting uh, piece of reporting. So, yes, uh, record high uh, coffee prices, um, perhaps going to to get a little bit worse uh, as we go forward. So that piece on the terminal. Let's go back to our top story now, though. Hamas and Israel have been negotiating via Qatar, Egypt and the United States on a ceasefire hostage and prisoner agreement. Hamas said it had agreed to a ceasefire proposal for the Gaza Strip. Israel's war cabinet, though, unanimously rejected it as far from Israel's necessary demands. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg Companion columnist Mark Champion. Mark, good morning. What do we know about the ceasefire proposal uh, and where exactly the, the various parties stand on it? Uh, Yes, I mean, it's one of these moments when we uh, have some of the picture, um, but not the details. And in these kinds of agreements, uh, it's all about the wording and the details. Um, So uh, what we do know is that the Hamas says that it has accepted a a deal um, that was proposed, they say, by Qatar and Egypt. Uh, The Israelis uh, say that uh, it is a long way from the deal that they had uh, offered. So in effect, This looks like a counter offer from Hamas. Um, The Israeli offer had basically said, uh, we will uh, stand down for 40 days uh, in exchange uh, for what we believe to uh, be um, uh, 33 uh, of the remaining roughly 100 uh, hostages who are thought to be alive in Hamas, in, in, in Gaza. Um, And, uh, you know, in return, it seems that uh, what Hamas has um, um, offered in, re- in, in response is uh, a three-stage process, um, which amounts to, in total, about 120 days. Uh, and in that s- staged process, there would be releases of hostages, exchanges for uh, Palestinian prisoners. Um, and the, uh, the kind of intent of the uh, Hamas counteroffer is that there will be uh, a, a much longer ceasefire uh, we don't know the wording. Um, there's been some reports that it says sustained calm. Um, but, uh, you know, as I say, the, everything is about the details and we don't know them as yet. We don't know the wording that we would know to really be able to judge fully, um, you know, what, what chances this has of succeeding. 
Yes, and as you say, Mark, it is a developing story. This morning we're just learning now, um, reportedly from uh, Army Radio, that that IDF, the Israel uh, Israeli Defence Forces, have confirmed that they have taken over the Rafa crossing. Um, you know, a lot of this also to do with what this means for the city of Rafa for that particular crossing. Israel did tell some civilians to move out of parts of the city. What do we know about the situation in terms of Israel's ongoing um, you know, military offensive? Yes, well, I mean, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the uh, Israeli prime minister, he's made it clear uh, over the last week or so uh, on a number of occasions that Israel intends to go into Rafa and to deal with the remaining uh, uh, four battalions that, of Hamas uh, fighters that it says are there, um, and no matter what. So they, what they were basically saying is, uh, yes, we'll talk about a cease, you know a temporary ceasefire, pausing the fighting to get some hostages out, um, and in that you know it, it has Im important implications also for the civilian population there because there'll be time uh, to get more aid in. Um, but uh, it was always, from the Israeli point of view, uh, going to be a, uh, a limited uh, time frame, after which uh, they would go into Rafa. Um, and when they do, um, there are, nobody's you know, counted exactly, but somewhere in excess of a million uh, Palestinians who have moved to uh, Rafa, uh, which is right on the southern border with Egypt, um, from the rest of Gaza. Uh, in order to find refuge. Uh, so what the Israelis have now been doing is setting up some tent camps uh, and ordering about 100,000 uh, uh, civilians out um, uh, to these uh, new tent camps or just to get out and move further north. Um, but it's, uh, you know, the, obviously, you know, you just do the math. That's the beginning of a process, not the end. Yeah, indeed. Mark Champion, Bloomberg Opinion columnist, thank you very much for joining us. And I point you to Mark's latest piece on this as well, um, writing about the role of Iran. Don't let Gaza help Iran cloak its own repression. You can find that on Bloomberg.com and, of course, on the terminal as well. Now let's think about earnings this morning. UBS has returned to profit after two loss-making quarters. The bank saying that its net income in the first quarter was $1.8 billion, compared with the estimate of just under $600 million from analysts. So a significant beat from the Zurich-based lender, uh, which has also been vocal in its opposition to the plan by Swiss authorities for higher capital requirements. Let's get more on this. Our Switzerland Bureau Chief Alessandro Speciale joins us now. Um, Alessandro Good morning. What do these earnings look like to you? Well, they are a solid start of 2024 for UBS after, as you said, two loss-making quarters. But at the same time, there is a, a big question mark, a big uncertainty hanging over the continuation, the next part of the year. Uh, UBS is flagging that uh, it, it will have a small decline in the in the second quarter, so it will slow down a bit. Uh, but at the same time, the real question mark is these plans by the Swiss government to ask for significantly more capital from UBS, around $20 billion from what we have heard. And of course, UBS has been pushing hard. It, it has been saying that it was the wrong remedy. It is the wrong solution to the Credit Suisse issue. Credit Suisse didn't go down because it didn't have enough capital. And it says that it will reduce its efficiency. The Swiss government will pr publish its proposals in the first half of next year. And we can expect furious lobbying until it happens. Is that on the, the issue of Credit Suisse and UBS saying that they expect that legal merger to be completed now by the end of this month? What about the underlying UBS business? How did that perform? So that one has been doing well, it's been doing better. Wealth management had 6.1 billion in this quarter, which is higher than estimated. The investment bank also posted a before tax profit, uh, so higher than estimates. Asset management still so-so, as -so, uh, slightly be before estimates. So the underlying is improving. Of course, the legal merger with Credit Suisse will allow UBS to migrate clients onto its own systems and then 
potentially, that's what they say, unlock big efficiency and more cost reductions and all that. Cost reductions are also is also on track. At the same time, the dismissal of all the what they call the non-core legacy assets from Credit Suisse, and this is also improving the capital position. So the execution of this mammoth, incredibly complex merger is on track. But of mm -hmm. course, then you have to show that the bigger bank is a bank that can actually unlock even more profits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bloomberg is going to um, hear from the UBS CEO, Sergio Amati, speaking to Bloomberg. Um, I wonder what you uh, expect the CEO to sort of be discussing and focusing on then. I mean, we know that Ulrich Kerner, the last CEO of Credit Suisse, is going to be leaving the bank in the weeks ahead. Sergio Amati is going to be front and centre, Alessandro. Yes, absolutely. He has... Uh... He has had a very good run so far because, of course, UBS has stepped in and saved Switzerland from a really, really big, complicated and the global financial system from a huge crisis. But now, of course, all the eyes are on the execution. And these plans from the Swiss government are potentially a stumbling block. So, of course, this is one thing that we want to look at and see what he will say. And, of course, for now, UBS is saying that this is not going to affect its plans to return funds to shareholders. In, uh, in March, UBS said it would buy back up to $2 billion of its shares over the next two years. They are saying that the capital uh, situation they have so far allows the execution of these plans. But of course, we have to see how this uh, uh, shapes up with the Swiss government plans. And this is what we want to hear from Ermonti. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.